Hey, Foot Clan, you sitting at home sometimes, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. Here's I'm sitting what you at do. home all the time. Exactly. Here's what you do. You get up on the ultimate draft kit and you read up on these players and you get ready to dominate this year. Look, the ultimate draft kit is available. It is up. If you want to see every single statistic we have on every player, every write-up, every video profile, you want all the tools, the analysis, the research, get it now. Spend some time looking at this beautiful thing, this masterpiece of fantasy football, and you can get it at ultimatedraftkit.com. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. Welcome in Saturday, July 11th, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, Mike, the Fantasy Hitman, right back with you for a third illustrious episode of the week. A Saturday episode. Illustrious. Illustriously oh. delivered, hand delivered. Yeah, uh, hopefully the weekend's this came. great now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the weekend's, the weekend's great now, Jason. <laughs> yeah. We did it. Fantastic. We should be probably, I mean, if if it's corollary to us having a show, considering the state of the world, we should probably be having three to four shows a day based on <laughs> It would be too saying. great. Too great. It could be a little too yeah. great. Welcome in. We have another divisional breakdown. The AFC South on today's show. Very excited to talk about these teams. I have questions that I need answered. And so I'll be leaning on these two. Gentlemen, these illustrious minds. I'm oh, just going to so try to use that word as, <laughs> as often as possible. <laughs> it's going to be good. We'll get into some mailbag as well. Um, let me remind you, as Jason did, head, o- head over to ultimatedraftkit.com. You can get access. Uh, you get access to the app on your phone as well when you go to ultimatedraftkit.com. We're on Twitter at the FF Ballers, Instagram.com slash fantasy footballers, and the community of uh thousands of foot clan members illustrious, illustrious a- community join the foot.com i if you asked me to de- to define the word yeah. illustrious i couldn't do it i do couldn't not do think it. that word means what you think it means no it, it probably does not it's just <laughs> long it's just a longer word and i like longer words i feel like it means shining brightly that's how i view it like as in i think that's illuminate. probably the, that's actually probably the definition al, uh, al borland uh, judge giamatti do you have any Insight for us. A well-known, respected, and admired. Oh, that shines bright to me. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty good. My vocabulary is on point, even if I didn't know it. All right, quick question of the day. Which off-season acquisition will end up being the most overhyped? And obviously for our show, this is in the fantasy football context. Because I think that there's a big difference. There are off-season acquisitions that will mean a lot to the National Football League team but not to fantasy owners. Right. Uh, I, I, you know, when I think of moves that are overhyped to me, um, I, I, I look at the Bears and acquiring Nick Foles and how that's going to change it for everybody. You know, it's either going to make Mitchell Trubisky a great quarterback because of the competition, and now he's really putting in the work. He's motivated. You know, or Allen Robinson, you know, he's a top 10 wide receiver last year with Mitch. Now he's got a Super Bowl MVP. Look, Nick Foles is a perennial backup. He's an okay quarterback. I don't know that he's better for this team than Mitchell Trubisky. He probably is. But I, you know what I mean? Like, I think he's just kind of a neutral sideways move. And I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, uh, hype on Allen Robinson and um, David Montgomery of just the offense going to be a lot better. I don't know that that's true. Remember when Mike Glennon made uh, Josh Rosen really good? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, you could be right. Um, we had a worst-case scenario in that Chicago offense last year. I think that's why people still have confidence in Allen Robinson. But, yeah, Nick Foles is not going to fix everything. He hasn't fixed everything wherever he's been, and it's been a lot of different teams. I I, I would probably bring up Stephon Diggs. But uh, you know that I will. 
Oh, really? Is that yours? <laughs> of course. Come on. I've been, I've been like the 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 most bearish on Stefan Diggs. Yeah. As a Buffalo Bill, I just I I don't get it. Yeah, from a that, from a hype I, perspective, yes, I, I don't get it. I think you guys could be right that he is the most overhyped. Uh, I don't think it's bad. I think Stephon Diggs is one of the better NFL receivers out there, and he's amazing, and he's going to help Josh Allen. He's going to help the Bills. It's a great acquisition. But those things can be true while it's still overhyped. Uh, those things can be true while it's like, oh, now we've got you know, a, a, a top 10 wide receiver. Josh Allen's going to be an MVP candidate, yada, yada. And I'll table this next name until we talk about this team on today's show. But Jonathan Taylor... <clears throat> is one that I uh, answered with a question mark here. Um, and that will really depend on the average draft position of Jonathan Taylor in my mind. But uh, there are leagues, there are uh, many of them in which he is going very high. So we can discuss, debate that shortly. Um, you can follow us uh, on, well, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, ad-free on Stitcher Premium. Appreciate all the reviews supporting the podcast. And uh, I don't think we have any news, do we, Brooks? Got anything to talk about in the news department? No, sir. Different NFL teams are Excellent. coming out with uh, like percentage of seats that they're willing to sell to people potentially this year. It's, it's very bizarre. It's so I like I don't know. It's I guess it's it's better for the NFL because they at least who was it that they just came out and said they'll sell twenty five percent of their Jacksonville yeah so Jacksonville they'll sell twenty five percent of their seats it they can make a little bit of money and that's that's how they feel comfortable implementing safety protocols for fans to be far enough away from each other but I'm telling you as one who's I've been to big games that are not full the the stadium is not full and it's i think worse i think the experience is worse uh than sitting at home than than having nobody there like i've i it's it's not a wildly popular sport but arizona teams have been dominant in arena football we have the arizona rattlers and they've won like so many of the super bowl version of the the of uh arena football and i've been to many of them and there is no energy it's it's almost <laughs> soul sucking the lack of energy because people want to you just hear like smattering you just hear like a couple people clapping and the the, <laughs> the 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 announcers trying to get people hyped and you're just but you can't because there's so few people trying to fill this space with sound that it almost comes off as just as more pathetic? sad more yeah. more sad and pathetic than than actually energizing the players like Maybe on the field, it's a different experience. They would rather have at least some people cheering them on, but it it, it comes off as as really sad, really, really sad when you're there. It's going to be a very strange season, no doubt. Let's get divisional. All right, AFC South breakdown time, starting with the Houston Texans who won the division somehow 10 and 6 uh they I I read some stat about the amount of games last year that they were trailing in going into the fourth quarter and I think it was 8 or 9 of them and they managed to go 4 and 4 in games where they started the fourth quarter behind which is a testament to Deshaun Watson and DeAndre Hopkins and company. It's also um, not going to happen again. Very yeah. Statistically, <laughs> that is an anomaly. So look you look don't at the Chargers. Yeah, the Chargers two years ago had like where they were just winning all their one score games. When that yeah. flips, all of a sudden you look like a bad team. And then they had a top ten uh, pick in the NFL draft. Yeah, they, mm -hmm. the Texans were the only playoff team with a negative point differential. Um, so and and they lose DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, and it didn't, you know, certainly with what Tennessee did in the playoffs, it didn't feel like Houston was the division winner. They were. And, uh, you know, Bill O'Brien gets carte blanche again as general manager and head coach. Big changes this offseason. DeAndre Hopkins departed to Arizona. Uh, if you hadn't heard about that, our thoughts. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Hopkins a Cardinal. But Hopkins in those trailing games, no, no wide receiver had more first down receptions when behind either. He was such an important part of them coming back in those games. They add David Johnson. They add Randall Cobb. They add Brandon Cooks. And, uh, you know, they are a team that has the luxury at this point in time of the lower paid quarterback. And so they can fill up cap space at positions that other teams don't running back. And they've chosen to do so for this window that Bill O'Brien and them see. But uh, let's talk about Deshaun Watson to begin with, because you know, from a fantasy perspective, he was uh, very good. Little bit of a, you know, we, we saw him run a couple great games together and then he'd disappear and then run a couple great games together. I think we all agree he's a very, very talented quarterback. Mike, you've spent some of this offseason talking about maybe the team has to depend on him more using his yeah. legs. Yep. Yeah, if we're talking about fantasy purposes, I'm not off Deshaun Watson. I think he can still get it done, especially with. With the wide receivers he has, they, you know, they excel at stretching the field. And Deshaun Watson, he he, th he throws touchdowns at a very high rate. This is just this is who he is. The decisions that he makes on the football field have led to a higher than average touchdown percentage. And then he doesn't have the safety blanket, which uh, that can that'll turn into targets for David Johnson, no doubt. But I think he's going to have to scramble a lot more than he has in the past, and we could see some really elite rushing numbers, which for fantasy purposes means that Deshaun Watts is going to be just fine. Yeah, I, I do have him rushing more this year as well, Mike. I've got him up near 500 rushing yards, six rushing touchdowns. He could easily have more than that. He had seven rushing touchdowns last season on only 413 rushing yards. I, I agree. I, I trust Deshaun Watson to get it done. And if this team is a little bit worse, uh, you know, because of the personnel, for fantasy purposes, Watson will scramble. He'll dump it off. He'll throw it deep. Um, and I, I, th I think he's going to have a great season. I've got him as my quarterback seven right now. I, I assume he probably would have been in the top four if he had Hopkins. My, my biggest concern with Houston is that I think this team has every chance at starting 0-4. He has to adjust to new wide receivers. Uh, I think he will, but it's not going to be fun to do it on the road against Kansas City, and then against Baltimore, then on the road against Pittsburgh, and then against Minnesota to begin the season. And so when you're yeah, trying to, tough. as a fantasy owner, you're, you're sitting here going, okay, in most fantasy drafts, you can get a Will Fuller, a Brandon Cooks at a discount. You know, compared to what a number one or number two in Deshaun Watson's offense would produce. But you have to bet on one of them. And you have to do it in the face of that schedule where you might not be able to kind of filter through those difficult matchups and say, I made the right choice. I mean, Will Fuller is, uh, I believe they he's on the fifth year option. They chose to pay him. We know that he has the existing rapport with Deshaun Watson. And yet more discussion in the fantasy community comes out around Brandon Cooks, they're being drafted around the same spot. Do you do you think Will Fuller is being ignored for fantasy purposes? I, I don't know that he's being flat ignored. Uh, you, everyone sees his upside, right? But everyone also sees him get injured left, right, and center. It's a matter of can he stay healthy and are you willing to take that risk in the seventh round? The back of the seventh round looks like where he's going right now. Wide receiver 35. I Look, I've got both of these guys in my 40s in wide receiver rankings, but that doesn't tell the whole story. I think that when you are drafting in the seventh or eighth round, those are the type of guys that if you've built your roster with solid wide receivers already, you've got volume and you're looking for high upside, both Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks represent that because if one of them ends up inheriting a large target share that DeAndre Hopkins left, then you know they, they're going to help you win games, win leagues. Last year, Darren Fells at tight end, who we've not talked about a lot, had seven touchdowns. He was the tight end eight through the first eight weeks. We talk about the 44% of the team targets vacated, which is the highest in the NFL with Hopkins leaving. Is Darren Fells a late round target for anybody? No, he's he's just the, the, the he'll be on your waiver wire. And when you have to stream 
and hope that a guy gets a touchdown, then he's in, in that group. I'm not counting on him uh, to be anything of a weekly starter for me. All right. Is there uh, another discussion or debate on this team? I mean, David Johnson yeah, I mean, is the, the, the running back core. We've talked about him a lot. He's going in the fourth round right now, the first pick of the fourth round. Two consecutive years with uh, without being able to get over that 3.7 yard per carry mark, phased completely out of the Cardinal offense last year, but arrives with nobody else really behind him. It's the David Johnson, Duke Johnson experience in Houston. I can't wait to see how many people draft the wrong one oh, man. in uh, their different platforms. Yeah, that's, that's a good piece of fantasy advice. When you're drafting D. Johnson running back for the Texans, <laughs> Be careful and make sure you're grabbing the right one. Look, Give the triple check. Last there were people drafting Matt Barkley instead of Saquon Barkley. So if if you've got the same initials, you're in trouble. Yeah, and same initials, same team, same position. Watch out. Um, but you you look at Carlos Hyde last year. Carlos Hyde had 245 carries, a thousand seventy yards, and six rushing touchdowns. Uh, you know, it, I think it's possible David Johnson is worse as a runner than Carlos Hyde right now because you just haven't seen him even hit four yards of carry in, in consecutive years. But while that's possible, I, I you know, David Johnson has had far more juice. He, he's a hard worker um, and he's going to get the rock. I mean, he's guaranteed for 250 carries here. So the, yes, volume, the volume is there. Is secure, yes. And if he gets 265 carries and only rushes for 3.9 a carry, he's he's a thousand yard rusher. And we know that when there is a large vacated targets, it goes to the running back. And I think David Johnson excels there. You've seen Arian Foster in the past with Bill O'Brien be used as a workhorse in both the rushing and receiving game. So I like I like David Johnson this season. And does that same logic apply to Duke? I mean, if if it's vacated targets and Duke has traditionally been their third down guy, I know that David is a great pass catcher. But Duke's getting on the field, is he not? Yeah, Duke will get on the field. I mean, he was on the field last year with Carlos Hyde getting those. But the the difference being that Carlos Hyde does not have that skill set. So I think there will be – it'll be much worse for Duke Johnson this year than last year because they'll want to keep David Johnson on the field. That's that's my belief. All right, let's talk about the Tennessee Titans. They finished 9-7 and seven last year, third in rushing yards per game. The Derrick Henry experience was a mighty fine one for fantasy football owners. 21 rushing touchdowns, uh, an improving defense, made the playoff run. I think they have a great defense heading into the new year. They lost, uh, well, Delaney Walker retired. Marcus Mariota, he's gone. Ryan Tannehill paid. And then they lose Jack Conklin on the offensive line. But when you look at this team, I think we probably all have them as the divisional favorites. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, that's fair. But at the same time, we do not have expectations for the kind of efficiency numbers that Ryan Tannehill put up last year. Yeah, this the Titans are very tough. Derrick Henry is very tough. I'm like, I'm not betting against him, but I, it's like it's concerning to spend that high of a draft pick on, uh, on a he's a two down guy. I mean, it's. It's been said over and over, but that the truth of the matter is that's what Derrick Henry is. He's not going to get the passing numbers that some of these other running backs are going to get. And when, like you, when you're drafting your quarterback, you want to make sure they have a rushing baseline most of the time because it it just makes things so much easier for fantasy. There's they're that much safer. And Derrick Henry doesn't carry the safety net of a pass catching running back. And you look at the numbers of <clears throat> of what can happen, like when Tannehill wasn't on the field. He was rushing for under 70 yards a game. Still putting up very respectable rushing numbers, but he didn't transform into the fantasy monster that he was until they made the switch to Tannehill, and Tannehill was playing just absolute bananas football, going crazy with, with deep completions to A.J. Brown every single game, really opening things up. So that's just, I'm not betting against Henry, but I'm very hesitant every time I go to draft him as my first running back. You're as my first pick. Yeah, it'll I, be interesting. I think he'll sign a contract, by the way, before the season begins. That is, I'm predicting that he extend okay. they extend him uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Jason, what were you going to say? 
I, I was just going to, you know, I, I totally understand the arguments here, Mike. It, it's what we've said for years. You want a guy who can't get game scripted out. Um, statistically speaking, you need a pass catching running back if they're going to end up in the top six. I mean, it just very rarely ever happens without someone having a baseline of rece receptions and Derrick Henry doesn't have it. And I am 100% betting on Derrick Henry. I'm not just not betting against him. I believe Derrick Henry is an outlier. There are human beings that are just different and all the statistical analysis does not always apply to every single human. Um, you know, and, and I will say this, it's better when they win than when they lose. That makes sense for just about all uh, first and second down running backs. Obviously, part of that's going to be he already scored touchdowns to get the lead, and part of that's going to be he he's up at 25, 26 carries. But if you look at, you know, there was a stretch last year uh, from week two through five where they lost three of four games. That was with Marcus Mariota. They're losing games playing poorly. He was on a 316 carry pace in those losses. Sure. He's going to get the rock. So he's one of those guys where I don't – He's when I say one of those guys, he's the only guy that I don't care <laughs> about the receptions. Like I'm, I'm much more hesitant on Nick Chubb, even though the upside's there. I'm not I flat betting on him the way I would bet on Henry. I don't have a lot of concern either with the offensive line turnover, with them investing the draft pick, losing Conklin – you know, with the, when he ran to the left, which is away from Conklin's side, Henry was six point five a carry. The Taylor Lewan run uh, to the left side, but Tannehill is here's an interesting split because the home road splits for Ryan Tannehill are worth mentioning. He was plus nine point nine seven fantasy points at home, so twenty eight point one two at home, eighteen point one five on the road. And we brought this up with certain players before: Drew Brees, Big Ben, come to mind. Is that something that fantasy owners should be aware of because of where they're drafting Ryan Tannehill? I mean, right now he's a 12th round draft pick, the no. quarterback 18. So if you're playing the streaming game, are you avoiding him on the road? No, I, Ryan Tannehill's still a really good late round target. I don't. We don't expect him to be able to continue what he did. But well, no, that wasn't my question of whether he's a good target. It was whether you use that data to stream him differently because you're probably in the streaming category at twelfth round, aren't you? You are in the you're in the category of if it doesn't work out, the investment was very low, so you can bail on him. But gotcha. if you if you're drafting, like if you're drafting Tannehill, guess guess where his first game is on the road. You're just so if you're drafting him, you're yeah. you're you're playing him, you're not going to be worried about the home road splits at least right away. To speak specifically to that, I'm not worried at all. He only had four road games uh after he became the starter and in some of those games there were, you know, those were three touchdown Derrick Henry games. Like, okay, well, he smashed them. They they, you know, it wasn't like he played poorly. Uh so I I don't worry about that small sample. All right, the other big fantasy names worth mentioning, AJ Brown, obviously. Right now being drafted as the wide receiver 17. Uh, absolutely dominant last season uh, over the back half. And then Jonu Smith. Do you think that A.J. Brown is, uh, well, all the upside exists. Well, the ceiling is, you know, top five, top three. Or do you worry about the up and down type of performances you might get in this offense due to the Derrick Henry focus? I don't worry about it considering the draft price. Like, it I'm I'm shocked and I'm I'm very very proud of the fantasy community that we've all gotten together and not overinflated the 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 draft price so at wide receiver 17 like yeah you you're, you're going to have some ups and downs but at that point of the draft you you're not you, you don't think you're getting a guy who's putting up top 12 numbers every single week at least you shouldn't yeah yeah and then uh John, Johnny Smith Jason has him up at tight end 7 I have him the lowest at tight end 19, Mike right in the middle, tight end 13. He's tough, uh, man. He's, he, he's tough. Yeah, he is. He, he's got so much potential and athleticism. And so those type of tight ends are always extremely tempting, <clears throat> Trey Burton. And, uh, and sometimes it works out. I mean, sometimes you do see those players emerge and break out. And Jonah Smith has had his fair share of monster plays. I mean, he's a great runner with the ball in his hands. Uh, I guess I'm not making the bet on uh, – Joni this year the way Jason is yeah you know every now and then every year you have to see the tight end breakout 
who has the physical ability and the opportunity on the field to really take that step forward. And that's where John, who, you know, he, he's still very young. He's crazy athletic. He's, I mean, to put him in the John who's or in the Trey Burton, uh, field is, is unfair to, <laughs> to, to John who Smith. Um, and you know, I think the fact that he's coming into this season as the guy, he's not behind Delaney Walker where he spent his entire career so far. Uh, they're going to involve him, and I could see him being the second target in this offense, at worst third. So, uh, yeah, I, I I love taking. Is that a because shot. you don't want to utter Corey Davis's name? Aloud? I was just going to bring him up. <laughs> yes, that is because I don't want to utter Corey Davis's name. It's crazy. Uh, in our Scott Fish Bowl draft, we're doing there. We are. I mean, where where Corey Davis goes <laughs> is is in no man's land. Nobody wants to touch Corey Davis. All right, before we move on to the Indianapolis Colts, we want to thank today's sponsor, WGU. You won't stop working until you reach your goals, and neither will WGU. That's why they've created an online university for people whose ambition never rests. WGU's innovative competency-based learning model was designed specifically to fit into the lives of busy adults. WGU is nonprofit, offering online bachelor's and master's degrees in business, IT, education, and nursing. And you can move through the material you already know and spend time learning what you don't, which is the uh, way to do it a little bit faster, uh, the, and then you finish faster. It's about half the cost of most other online universities, so you can graduate with far less debt or none at all. And you can get your $65 application fee waived at wgu.edu slash fantasy footballers. That's wgu.edu slash fantasy footballers. All right, let, let's talk about the team that I think has, uh, in my mind, maybe more question marks than any other team in the division. And that's the Indianapolis Colts. I mean, last year, this is we were just talking about this in the studio because we had a... Uh, a live show in Phoenix. And uh, that show was what, in August. And I mean, this was this was less than a year ago that they went from the divisional favorites. I with, don't believe you. With Andrew Luck as their quarterback to suddenly losing their franchise quarterback and being thrust into the Jacoby Brissett experience and uh, completely dis, just changing this team overnight. And so last year they go seven and nine, which again we I think we all like in respect Frank Reich the job he did. I mean seven and nine feels like a pretty good accomplishment considering yeah. the situation that they were put in. Sure. And so they they were seventh in rushing yards per game. They were able to run the football. They have a great offensive line. Uh, they ended the 2019 season with a PFF graded third best offensive line. They are PFF's number one offensive line heading into 2020. They're which amazing. Is, which is a mu music to the ears of their very uh, not fleet of foot quarterback, Phillip Rivers, <laughs> one of their big offseason additions, bringing in the veteran Phillip Rivers, Jason's favorite player. And then they also invested uh, heavily on the offensive side of the ball in the draft. Michael Pittman Jr., a second round pick. Jonathan Taylor, many people's uh, number one collegiate running back. Uh, maybe the best pure runner in college football in the second round. And so uh, they lost Eric Ebron. They lost Devin Funches, who they never really had. But this is a team that is in a position where you could you could look very optimistically at this season and what they the weapons that they have. Is, is, that, is this the team that you think is most likely to threaten Tennessee at the top of the division, or do you still like what Deshaun Watson can do? Uh, I, I think the Colts have a, a really solid team front to back. Their defense, um, I think, is young and very good. Their offense with that offensive line is great. They are the Vegas favorites currently. If you're yeah. sorry, Jay, the, the, the Vegas has them projected at nine wins. I don't yeah, know this, if we've mentioned that. This this should be a a, a solid team. And when I look at what Philip Rivers does for this team, it's it's fantastic. Um, it's the exact opposite of what we often say to me. Uh, you know, we'll talk about C.D. Lamb comes in, and it's not great for him, but it's great for Dak. These pieces that are added. This is the opposite. Like I don't see this as a, you know, all these great pieces, T.Y. Hilton, and you know, pass catching running backs out of the backfield, and Paris Campbell and Michael Pittman. I I don't see them as an upgrade for Philip Rivers because last year he had Keenan Allen and. Hunter Henry for pardon Mike Williams and, and Austin Eckler. 
But he is such an upgrade over Jacoby Brissett for these fantasy options that I'm willing to trust uh, T.Y. Hilton and Jonathan Taylor, your possibly most overhyped. Um, is that you pooping on me? Yes, that's what I okay. said to you. Uh, well, let me just make <laughs> let me just make the case for that situation. And look, I I like Jonathan Taylor, and if he's given the you know the lion's share of carries in this offense with that offensive line, it's going to be outstanding. Um, you know, we know that Philip Rivers, the Chargers, uh, they ranked first, third, and eleventh in backfield targets over the past three seasons. This was not on a team that only had backfield targets. You had Keenan Allen, you had Mike Williams, you had Hunter Henry, you had the ability to throw the ball downfield to Travis Benjamin, he still prefers to throw the ball to the running back position. One of the questions that a lot of people have is whether Jonathan Taylor is going to be involved in that capacity. Not a lot of catches in at the collegiate ranks. Pro Football Focus credited him with eight drops on 50 catchable passes. Um, peop, I think he could. He could end up in that role, but they have a very dynamic pass catcher in Naeem Hines. And they have two running backs on first and second down, that are very good. Marlon Mack is a very good runner. He's He had over 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns. He had the fourth most rushing first downs in the league. And so it's just a matter of when and if Jonathan Taylor represents that fantasy gold for your team. And when you draft him in the third round, you are dependent on Jonathan Taylor. So whether he's overhyped or not, I can't see the future. I don't know if Marlon Max is going to get banged up. I don't know if Taylor's going to get enough passing game work. My prediction is that he won't put you in a position where you're happy you're dependent on him in the first half of the season. And I think we all agree with that. The, the, the beginning of the season, Jonathan Taylor is going to be splitting first and second down work with Marlon Mack. And then, probably does not project this year to be the pass catching guy. Well, while I love Jonathan Taylor and if you want him, you're going to have to draft him in the third. I think at the end of the year, they're going to realize that as good as Marlon Mack is, Jonathan Taylor is a, you know, he's, he's just a different level of human. He's 226 pounds, ran sub four, four. He is, he's just something that you can't replicate uh, with another with another guy, and I, I do think he'll win the job and be really good for fantasy towards the second half of the season. I don't usually like drafting guys that are going to be better in the second half and worse in the first half. I want to get off to a hot start, make sure I make the playoffs. You can't win a championship if you don't make the playoffs, uh, no matter how good your team is at the end of the year. So uh, I, I do see what you're saying in the overhyped because he's a third-round pick, um, and it, you might get off to a slow start. And but the, the offensive line, man, it, we focused on it, but you can't undervalue what that means for a for running backs and a good running back. Like that's this this is Zeke stuff to me. I I'm not, I'm fine making that comp. This is this is Zeke possibilities for Jonathan Taylor, where Zeke would have come in and he would lead the league in rushing yards per game. He didn't really get past. We had the one season where he really got off on uh, a whole bunch of receptions. But before that, Zeke was dominant, one of the most consistent running backs, if not the most consistent running back for fantasy purposes, because he's good, like really, really good. And his offensive line was fantastic. So I, it, it the, the third round, the end of the third round is very tough. Running back 21, though, is. When you it doesn't put it in sound line, so bad when you say it yeah, like that. Yeah, when you say running back 21 in context, it's it's not so bad. It's it's well, just I, the, it, the upside of what Jonathan Taylor could be compared to guys, compared to like the, the people who are being drafted as running back 20, running back 22, you know, right around him. The range of outcomes, that ceiling that Jonathan Taylor could hit is, is, is astronomically high for me. Is there a... Uh for for the sake of a fun exercise, if Marlon Mack didn't exist, Jonathan right. Taylor would be in my first round. Is Jonathan Taylor a top ten pick? Is he yes. a top five pick uh, with the I, offensive line and his pedigree? I would draft him before Nick Chubb. He's very interesting. I I don't you know 
depending on whether you can withstand those first few games of the season, I really do see a pathway for him. It's just with Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, or Saquon Barkley, those are top 10 NFL draft picks. Mm, yes, they were there is a, go right away. Yeah, You know he's getting the ball on, on day one. And this could be something where, uh, you know, <laughs> we, we're going to have a modified training camp. We're going to have a modified idea of what these teams are going to be doing because this would have been one of the camp battles where you're going like, I mean, I, we've all seen those pieces when the news breaks and Jonathan Taylor's getting first team reps, you know, a week into training camp, you're going, oh, oh. And then his draft position shoots up. You're making more of a gamble here. You know, Marlon Mack is a player that is completely ignored in fantasy drafts because of the situation he's in where, where you know that he's not going to get all of the work and Jonathan Taylor's the future. Uh, are you both hands off on Marlon Mack in the eighth round where no. it's just like no upside? No, no, cer certainly not. And the same for Damian Williams, was, where it's the exact same situation of uh, for running backs in Kansas City. I love Edwards Alaire. I think this, this I, I can make the same argument of yeah his ceiling, but you have to make room for what if what if you're wrong, and like the fact that you can grab Marlon Mack and Damian Williams, who very well could be the starter for the first four to six games if not more for their for their teams then yes I'm, I'm i'm willing to draft him at running back 38 would you actively look to target jonathan taylor as that third running back yes I, I i was actually going to say when when you guys were talking about um you, you know he's going in the third round and how uh, roster construction matters here i think jonathan yeah. taylor is if you want to go running back running well, back running high back, tee Yes, if you go running back, running back, running back, and he's your third running back, and you've got two solid guys already on the roster, and then flood your lineup with you know quality value at wide receiver the rest of the way until maybe grabbing a handcuff late, that's how I end up with Jonathan Taylor on one of my redraft teams, is that type of a strategy. And and I think I'm going to be happy by the end. Be, you know, I know he wasn't a, a first round pick. He wasn't a top 10 pick, you know, like like these Zeeks and Saquon. So obviously that's why he's not being drafted in the first round. But you do have to keep in mind the Colts didn't have a first round pick. And they and and when they when they used their pick on Michael Pittman, they were really close to getting Jonathan Taylor there. They just wanted to get Phillip Rivers another receiving option. And then when Jonathan Taylor went a couple more spots, they traded up. They traded back up to get Jonathan Taylor with their draft capital. He was only nine spots behind uh, Clyde edwards alaire So the, the draft making, capital. You're making the point that their investment was very high. At yes. the Colts, it's, about a, it's, yeah, about as, it's high as high as you can, can get. get. Yeah. I love Michael Keaton. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, at the wide receiver position, we talked at length about T.Y. Hilton. He was one of my uh, bounce back candidates on the show. Yeah, we like him. I believe two episodes ago. Uh, then it's a, you know, it's a number of gambles, late round gambles. Michael Pittman Jr., listening to Frank Reich and the offensive uh, coaches talk about Michael Pittman Jr. This really, you know, I almost feel like it's being cliche, but he, he really fits the Mike Williams <laughs> yes, situation perfectly. Yeah, I mean, he he's does. totally the big bodied. High, you know, draft capital, really talented wide receiver playing with Phillip Rivers, who's willing to throw it deep and and into the end zone. It, that's a such a good comp. It's yeah. it's e it's so easy that it feels lazy, but it, sometimes it sometimes it's matching up a little too much. <laughs> right. Sometimes the easiest answer is the right one. Yeah, and then Paris Campbell coming back is going to help this offense tremendously. Um, he is very much a Debo Samuel type of, you know, you're going to see end of rounds, you're going to see screen game play. He's a very dynamic player that could end up in the end zone more often than you would have thought at the beginning of the year. True. Uh, I'm excited about this team. I'm excited to see what Frank Wright can do uh, with Phillip Rivers. And speaking of boring, I, but I, I think you'll be fine if you're drafting him and you're playing him. Jack Doyle. I think will be a tight end one by the end of the season. It may not be spectacular. It's going to be boring. It's going to be blah. Business-like. But <laughs> it's I mean, it, granted new team and everything, but you have to look at Phillip Rivers' tendencies, and he likes to target the tight end position. I mean, going back... To Antonio Gates, I'm certainly not saying Jack Doyle is comparable to a, a Hall of Fame 
quality player of Antonio Gates, but Hunter yeah, Henry those last baby year. Hands. Yeah, Jack Doyle on the baby hands. Yeah. Last year, when Hunter Henry came back from his injury, he was 18% of the targets from Phillip Rivers. Well, the Antonio Gates thing is interesting because Jack Doyle has the athleticism of a very late career Antonio Gates. And yet that, <laughs> and yet that Antonio Gates very late season, was yeah. heavily targeted, even though he was a lumbering type of player at that time. And I don't mean disrespect to Jack Doyle, but Doyle is not what peak Antonio Gates was. Very, no tight end right. ever was. But Doyle represents tried and true, baby hands or not, probably going to be targeted. If we're looking at Naeem Hines getting targeted like Austin Eckler, you have to look at Doyle and say, yes. He may get four of the most pedestrian catches per week, but that still says something for the tight end position. Yeah, yeah Eric I, I, Ebron is gone, and as much as I want Mo Ali Cox, Gigantor to break out and be a thing, like you have to bet on Jack Doyle being the the main tight end for this team. Yes, you uh, the main tight end, but we need to at least bring up the name for a second time on the same episode. Oh Trey no, Burton. we do not. We do. They just He's went out tight and end paid three. He's not going to be the tight end three. Uh, Are you talking about Trey Burton? Yes, Trey Burton, who I believe was with Doug Peterson back on the Eagles. They went and signed him. Um, I, you know, I'm just saying it's not just if, – if Trey Burton is healthy, it's not just going to be Jack Doyle there. Correct. I, I agree with that. Uh, Jacksonville is the last team from the AFC South we need to discuss. Uh, last year was 6-10. and 10. This defense has been – absolutely disintegrated from what it once was. Yeah, they got thanos Yeah, I mean, I think they're all gone. I mean, everybody's gone. And now, you know, Clayus Campbell is, is gone as well. Uh, their defense was 28th in the NFL in defensive uh, yards per game in terms of giving up to the uh, opposing running backs. <laughs> so I mean, it's insane, just... man. It's just not good. So, you know, when you look at the division and the fact that you have teams that are primed to compete, Indianapolis, Houston, Tennessee. Um, this is really finding the the fantasy gold in the midst of what might be a rough season. We like Jay Gruden. He's the new offensive coordinator. Replaced John Filippo, who, uh, you know, had to deal with Nick Foles not there, and then it's Gardner Minshew, then it's Foles, then it's Gardner Minshew. Uh, Doug Marone's still the head coach. Last year, this was... Um, this was a place where you could find fantasy value. Gardner Minshew uh, offered that at times as a streaming quarterback option. Leonard Fournette had a, an absolutely monster season. DJ Chark had a breakout season. D.D. Westbrook was a huge disappointment. Yeah, when you was. When you came into last year, you were expecting D.D. to be the guy to take the mantle as a fantasy producer for Jacksonville, and he just didn't do it. Yeah, it. Uh, th there was the wrench thrown in that plan of – Nick Foles, yeah. Your, yeah, your hope of Dee Westbrook relied heavily, or mine, I should say, relied heavily on Nick Foles being the starting quarterback for that team. So that it, and Gardner came in; he was great when he threw the ball down the field. DJ Chark quickly showed he can be one of the best deep threats in in all of football. The dude is gigantic. The dude is very, very fast, and he's being drafted as the wide receiver twenty three. I have. I don't know that there is a draft I have left yet without targeting DJ Chark it, and very, very successfully getting him on most of my teams. He feels like a just, my guy to you, yes, true, I, tried and true. I am so madly in love with what DJ Chark could be this year and his draft price of of being drafted as a borderline wide receiver too is just madness to me. Yeah, and then, I mean, DJ Chark is uh, by far the best fantasy option at wide receiver on this team. I agree with you on that. It's all going to come down to what Gardner Minshew is able to do in his sophomore season. Sixth round draft pick. Um, you know, it's not all roses for Gardner Minshew as an NFL sure. quarterback, but that might not matter for fantasy purposes. One of the, the numbers I looked up, uh, Sharp Football was discussing this. He completed 60% of his passes. Um, while his expected completion percentage was 65.8% per NFL next-gen stats, that was a minus 5.2% mark. Um, David Sharp Blau, was talking about that? Yeah, David Blau was the actual only quarterback to do worse than Gardner Minshew because Gardner Minshew had a 7.9-yard uh, average depth of target 
which ranked 28th in the NFL. So he had uh, kind of higher completion percentage type of targets and did not meet the next-gen stat expectation for it. So from a passing perspective, there were some blots on his game, but he didn't throw a lot of interceptions. He's a great scrambler. He was very good when he went deep, even though it wasn't as often as other quarterbacks. And DJ Chark is a dynamic playmaker down the field, and they had to play from behind last year. I think we all expect them to do it again this year. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like him. I just know that things can go more sideways for a six-round quarterback on a bad team than they can for other easier-to-predict quarterbacks. The nice thing, though, is that with Foles gone, they don't have anywhere to turn. So I think they are going to ride Gardner into the ground even if they are 0-16, and, and then they will draft uh, a, a replacement at the end of this year. But for fantasy, he was on pace for about 400 yards on the ground scrambling that baseline coming into year two uh, for a guy who, you know, his, his 16 game pace was 3,700 yards, 24 touchdowns, seven interceptions. It's actually better than that because some of those game logs were half games that were kind of split with uh, Nick Foles. So for a rookie, those numbers are actually really good for a rookie quarterback. They're very similar to what Kyler put up, and Kyler's going super high in the draft. So, uh, you know, I don't expect him to be able to take that step forward um, like we expect with Kyler. He doesn't have the pedigree for a reason. But with DJ Chark and company there and with Chris Thompson out of the backfield, you know, you talk about those, yes. uh, you know, those high target throws. Uh, it, when you have a really good uh, pass catching running back as opposed to giving a hundred of those targets to Leonard Fournette, who is not great at that. Um, you know, I, I expect those numbers to go up. So I, I like if you're in a two quarterback league, I love Gardner Minshew's Gardner Gardner Minshew as my second quarterback. Um, yeah, I think that context I can get behind. <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm. A, I I feel like I am not supporting the Jorts the way that you both are. Uh, maybe, Certainly not the way I do. Yes, maybe is- more as a risk aversion. You know, you say that he's going to be run into the ground. Doesn't mean you can play him for fantasy if he's out there every single week. So we'll see. Leonard Fournette um, last year, very good. Uh, I was looking at some of the breakdown of what his passing work was, and thirty nine percent of his passing work came when being blown out. So this was that situation where they didn't have anybody else to put on the field. On third down, Leonard Fournette came in and accumulated the majority of his passing work while the team was getting its butt kicked. If you know, won't happen again. If Chris Chris Thompson Thompson. is that guy, then you should expect a significant uh, downgrade on the passing work. Doesn't mean that Fournette doesn't positively regress in the touchdown category, and maybe you know he's being drafted as the RB fifteen. When you look at Fournette at RB fifteen, and then Jonathan Taylor at RB twenty one, I think it was. You know, are you taking the shot on Jonathan Taylor? Man, Fournette is uh, Fournette is so difficult because he he should see a like he should see a monster workload, but there are so many of those like just red flags accumulating of the team wanting to trade him, the team altering his contract so to take guaranteed money away that you know like it really really felt like if you had if you had asked fantasy players in May heading into the draft is Leonard Fournette going to be the starting running back for Jacksonville we would have said oh you, probably but 60% chance that he is like there was a really high probability he wasn't going to be the starter which which just brings in huge concerns when you're investing a a second round pick into a running back, especially to me uh, when Chris Thompson has joined forces again with Jay Gruden. Like, yes, Chris. I Thompson, would take Jonathan Taylor. Chris Thompson. <laughs> okay, perfect. I would do perfect. that. I mean, you number one offensive line in Indianapolis, twenty sixth ranked offensive line in Jacksonville, worst first down running back in all of football last year. Leonard Fournette, two point seven a carry on first down, four broken tackles, and maybe doesn't get third down anymore. And too, and too also expensive. Has a, too expensive. Ha- also has a very rich injury history. Uh, he <laughs> he stayed healthy last year, but you know that's still a, a concern. History. That's still that's still there. It seems like a that's like a storybook. I mean, just a rich tale of injuries for 
Leonard Fournette. That's a good point, Jay. I mean, we've brought it up every off season, and then he made it through a season, and you don't talk about it at all. But um, now, if for the wide ahead, receivers, Mike. for the for the other wide receivers, like Chark is locked in. Chris Conley flashed a, a few times. We know that he is. Uh, a, his athleticism is actually very, very impressive. They added Lavisca Chenault in the second round, who is a very dynamic uh, player. Once you get him the ball in space, do you have? Are you drafting anybody else from this team, or are you just? I'd I'd be more inclined to take a a, a chance on Tyler Eifert than I would Conley Cole and then the gamble at wide receiver. If you're looking right. at, you know, um, somebody that could be a little undervalued, they paid to bring in Tyler Eifert. So I I think that he could be just as, you know, I'm not trying to get more Jacksonville Jaguars on my team. Don't, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think don't hear what to, I'm not saying. I, I was gonna say I think we need clarity because you said you'd rather have Tyler Eifert, but. Make no mistake, you're not leaving any drafts with Tyler Eifert. Yeah, make no mistake, I will not have any of these play. I mean, this is a if you're in a Jacksonville only draft, okay? Right. Then oh, there's that, a yeah. Then there's a chance that Tyler Eifert's um, on my team. I would rather have the gamble on Cole or the gamble on Conley or the gamble on Chenault. I would if I had to take or, a shot on one of them, it would be Chenault late, just because over, he's over Didi. Yeah, I mean, I I, I would I, take him. Over I'd probably Didi, yeah. I'd probably go Didi. I, well, I mean, Chanel, I mean, I guess they're both pretty much free. Chanel is undrafted in almost every league. So I'm just looking at a late round dart throw that could explode. I mean, Chanel is a big, strong, fast, you know, uh, his athletic profile says maybe he could do something special. But uh, I think we're we're talking about these guys because we're talking Didi's about Jacksonville. Gonna start, and know, if we yeah. weren't talking about Jacksonville, we wouldn't be talking about. And don't the, and Jacksonville fans don't be mad at us i mean they have vegas's lowest projected win total in the nfl i would love to see jay gruden succeed i would love to see uh gardner Minshew succeed anytime a quarterback can fifth sixth seventh round go out and earn a job i'm all for it I, i'd love to see dj chark have a great season those things could still happen <laughs> with four and a half wins which is what vegas has them at so um let's do a little mailbag before we close this out Bag. Bag. <laughs> Chris Conley had 90 targets, man. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Cole did, uh, or not Keelan Cole. Wasn't Didi hurt for a significant yes. part of the year? D yeah, Didi went in. And Chark. Hurt. And Chark got beat up, right? A little. He Chark got beat up a little bit at the end. I remember starting Conley as like a yeah, desperation he was, he flex was, a couple of he times. He was a waiver guy. How'd it work out? It was, uh, I think I was okay one, one, one time. <laughs> You picked the week? Yeah, I mean, well, with those guys hurt, it was like, okay, Conley's the next man up, and they paid him to come in there and play wide receiver. So, I don't know. Wasn't wasn't cozy. Uh, if you have a question for the show, head to thefantasyfootballers.com, click the Submit a Question button, or you can dial the voicemail hotline, 302-464-TFFB. Let's go ahead and grab a voicemail question. What's up, ballers? This is Kenny from the island of Guam. Quick question. In a 10-team, 2QB league, when do you start drafting your second quarterback, and who do you target? Thanks, guys. Bonjour. Well, first of all, bonjour, yes. <laughs> yes, of, well, yes, of course. <laughs> I, I think there's there's kind of two strategies I employ in a two-quarterback league, and where I draft my second one depends on what I did with my first. Um, it's either I'm going to spend the first four or five rounds, depending on which quarterbacks go off the board, not taking a quarterback, in which case I'll probably double-tap them. You know what I mean? My my second quarterback might mm. be a Matthew Stafford, and I'll just come. Zombie land strategy. I got you. <laughs> right. Yes. Um. Uh, blah blah. Um. Yeah. It, but sometimes I like the strategy where maybe in the early second you grabbed a good value on a good quarterback that dropped there. A Deshaun Watson drops a Kyler Murray, and and if that's the case then I'm going to wait until most of the quarterbacks are gone and grab one of the, you know, uh, grab someone like a Gardner Minshew who I can get so late um, to pair with a really good good quarterback. That's how I approach it. Yeah, and it, it's not what round you can get it in. Just make sure you're paying attention to the tiers as they are being depleted. All right, Michael Thomas question from Jake in Wyoming. I'm in a PPR league. At what point? In the first round, would you consider taking Michael Thomas instead of a running back? In other words, who's the first running back you would pick Michael Thomas ahead of? Mm. Yeah, there are different ways to ask that question. 
Um, what do you guys think? Are you, Jason, yeah. we did a mock draft. You took Dalvin Cook in the first round. Would you take Michael Thomas over Dalvin Cook today? Yeah, I would take Michael Thomas over Dalvin Cook today um, because Dalvin Cook is still threatening holdout, and even though he's great, um, I, I, I I would. But uh, I would take Michael Thomas over Joe Mixon and Miles Sanders, um, Nick Chubb. Uh, you know, it's and, a full uh, PPR Dalvin, as well. I mean, it's yeah, and full PPR. Ooh, okay, so here's well, here's the question, Jason. Yeah. Would you take Michael Thomas in a full PPR? Or would you take Derek Henry? I knew that was the name you were coming up with. And that's a, would, take that's a brutal Thomas. question, and I'll in take a, Michael Thomas. Yes, yeah, so it's <laughs> unanimous. In a full PPR, I'm going to take Michael Thomas over Derek Henry. All right. A, uh, here, here's a question from Scott in Indiana. He says, how bad does Justin Herbert have to be to become Justin Turdbert? Oh, so this is, this is a great a, question. Uh, this on is this a show? Nick, nickname question. How bad does he have to I think to he be? just has to have one bad week. Yeah, one bad week <laughs> on this show. Like, come on. What is, he, when it's a low-hanging <laughs> poop joke, no. we're going to take it. Uh, yeah, but actually, let's let's be honest. Like let's a dingleberry. Deep. Yeah, let's, I got you. <laughs> let's dive a little deeper here because if he comes out and is not good, we're not going to throw him under the bus. It's only after he has expectation and then lets you down, right? Because like maybe he comes out, has this great not game, and everybody show. streams him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's oh, gonna dude. poop in his big boy pants. Uh, yeah, and I mean, he's gonna be Justin Turdbert a lot. <laughs> Look, it's so unfair. The man has heard name. that before. I mean, just, there's no question he's heard that. And this look. Uh, well, it's Monday, either him Monday. or it's it's Turd Rod Taylor. I mean, it's either. Oh, I, I don't oh know. man, we can get you no matter who <laughs> you are. We can get you no matter what. We'll find. Hold a way. on, hold on. You got? Do you have a T in your name? Mm. Mm. You're going this, down. <laughs> Oh, you got a P in your name? Mm, going down. <laughs> Here, it's over. Number. He has a second question, a little more fantasy relevant. Uh, the impact of Tyrod Herbert on Keenan Allen has been discussed at length. How does it affect your view of Hunter Henry? A uh, little behind the, behind the scenes. Jason was pushing us pretty hard to get Hunter Henry as our tight end in the Scotty Fish League. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not uh, give him his way, but you know, looking back, Mike, do you wish we had? I do. We have, not. we have Jarwin and Herndon. Yep, I'm perfectly fine with those guys, and because because Jason wanted to bring up uh, Charles Clay, uh, Charles Clay when in the time in Buffalo, Charles Clay was very solid for fantasy purposes, but there was a reason that Charles Clay had a nickname, and his nickname was Mister Necessary because there was nobody else to throw the ball to, <laughs> and and Taylor is surrounded by talent, and and Hunter Henry is a very talented tight end he's just is he's in that group of i don't have full confidence in this tight end to be good so i'm not drafting him at the at the price yeah i mean he was a, a value in the draft when i was arguing for him at, at adp i'm usually avoiding hunter henry i expect he'll have about the same target share that he had which was really really good but we expect the total targets to go come way down uh as a team uh, at least if Tyrod is is the quarterback. So he's still going to be solid. He's always been good for fantasy when he's on the field. Um, but if the passing volume decreases, then you've got, you know, Hunter Henry light. And Hunter Henry wasn't Travis Kelsey. He was he was an okay option. So now he's an okay light. Yeah, I mean, in is terms of projecting, projecting yes. Tyrod Taylor, there's a statute of limitations in my mind on taking – things that a player has done from a different franchise so long ago and projecting them forward. I just can't do it with Tyrod anymore because I have no clue what on earth he has left. It's just funny. He, he's, he was always a good fantasy player. And he, honestly, he could be good. Like Taylor could be really good for fantasy for the first I, half of this year. Unfortunately, due to my historical analysis <laughs> of Tyrod Taylor on this you show, have to withdraw from the I have to recuse myself from hyping him again. I may or may not have believed what you said in Cleveland. Yes, but I did not. Well, <sighs> I did not then. We have, we, have, uh, we have fully flipped our roles here. It's a wonderful ride, Mike. You're going to enjoy it quite a bit. Strap in. All right. That is it for today's episode of the show. Less than a week left to head to footclangiveaway.com and enter to win a signed Devontae Adams jersey. That's a nice one. Footclangiveaway.com, completely free to enter bunch of different ways, head over there. 
That'll do it for today's show. Thank you, Foot Clan, for tuning in, supporting us. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday or whenever you're listening to this. And we'll be back next week with some more Divisional Breakdowns. Thank you for tuning in. Stay safe, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.